and all these clothes I was perfectly happy with before. They're all being discounted! This is terrible! And then you run home and put all your suits on offer up. Hello and welcome to Your Business, Your Wealth. My name is Paul Adams. I am the founder and CEO of Sound Financial Group, and I'm joined by my co-host, Corey Shepard, a man whose shirt is often blue, but his attitude never is. Corey, as <laughs> always, thank you for being here. Oh, that's great. I like that. I'm always nervous about how you're introducing me. and uh, Our audience is nervous yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> so as we talk today, we... You know, we named the episode in a way that was meant to be a little bit provocative and kind of put you in a mindset of what mindset do I have? You see, you either intentionally build the mindset that you're going to have about investing or you're going to inherit the default mindset. The default mindset comes from one of two places. It's going to come from the fact that we have a deep history as a species of being pattern recognition beings, it's allowed us to grow crops, predict weather, all run those away things. from tigers in the jungle. Yeah, we get, you got to run yeah. from the old tigers. Except the media also feeds into this pattern recognition and puts us in yeah. the position where we will attempt to do things with our investing based upon the way we've been wired up and how we've been successful as a society thus far that can actually act against us when it comes to investing. So for instance, just kind of setting the tone for the conversation today, as of the time of the re this recording, the Standards & Poor's 500 is up 30% from its bottom. Now we're not back to pre-recovery levels, but depending on how the market goes the rest of this week, we might inch back over 3,000 in the S&P 500. We're just below that right before doing the recording. We're somewhere near halfway back up from the, the drop, give or take a little bit, depending on your account. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly right. Or we're maybe, over half. Or over half, yeah. And so as as you listen and think about this, you, you don't, ne this is not necessarily you, but this is someone you know. You don't know who exactly, but much like the Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation, <laughs> You will know somebody that is in one of these mindsets that has people feel like they can predict the market. Corey, would you just take a few moments and kind of lay out the two polar different mindsets we're going to talk about today? So the the first one is the market timing mindset. The second one is the disciplined in investor mindset. Now, market timing mindset is what the financial industry and financial media would really like us all to have because it produces the most amount of transactions that fund the activity that they're that they're after and boy do you and, have to pay attention to the media if you're going to be mm -hmm. timing the market you really yeah you need the information you need the the new ideas you need the newsletters and the idea is if it's working perfectly the market's about to crash you see it in advance you sell you wait and buy back in at the opportune time now people say this <laughs> by the way have you ever seen the memes online where it's like you think you look like this and it's like this buff dude actually... at the gym and it's actually like somebody who weighs 140 pounds and they're just little and but they see this much but what Corey just laid out is how market timers see themselves in the mirror that that's what they're going to be able to do so just walk through those steps again Corey. You see it in advance, you sell, and you wait and, and buy back in at the opportune time. Now, we all feel like we've heard of someone who's done this. It's kind of like baby pigeons. Paul insisted we talk about baby pigeons. You know <laughs> that they exist, but it's hard. Like, when have you, when's the last time you actually saw one? Now, you might think that you saw a baby pigeon market timer because someone said that it worked, but I've yet to see anyone who's willing to show me their brokerage statement that says, here's where I got out without losing an ounce on the downside and got back in without losing an ounce of the upswing. I've never well, seen it. And I've seen it, 
but only on one of the transactions. That same a person <laughs> had 15 other transactions where the old yeah. market timing didn't quite work out, whether that was individual stock selection, because that's the different breeds of market timing. Some are, you'll hear strategic asset allocation, market timing, individual stock speculation, market timing, commodities trading, market timing. All those things can be lumped into a, a vein that we'll just refer to speculation and gambling. Now, the reason why we're a little bit harsh and calling it speculation and gambling is because it produces results in a way that are unpredictable. So if you were playing at a casino. And I don't think it's harsh. It's not, it's yes, not harsh you. to just call something what it is. You don't go to the casino and say, oh, I'm going to spend the weekend saving for the future or investing <laughs> for the future. <laughs> <laughs> Which that is, I think that is such a great point. Nobody once says that. They say, I'm going to have fun. They say, I'm going to try my hand at the tables. They say, we're going to go out and party. But they don't say, I'm going to Las Vegas to invest in my future unless they're going to a right. conference there they're going to learn from. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with a weekend at Vegas, in Vegas, it, as long as you're not betting your whole future. Oh my gosh. Like, j let's just go deeper into that for a moment, Corey, because I think you're hitting on a vein that a lot of people could resonate with. <clears throat> no one has any problem with their friends, family members, teenagers saying, hey, I'm going to go gamble a little bit of my disposable money. But how much would you freak the, insert your favorite expletive here, out if you had someone you care about say, hey, what I'm going to do is go to Vegas and I'm going to make enough money to retire. I'm going to invest in my future. I'm going to implement a strategy that I don't think anybody else in all the time of all the speculation and gambling has figured out. And as a result of my strategy, I'm going to have positive outcomes in these huge buildings with marble floors and thousands of hotel rooms and tons of employees and big ornate entertainment. And I'm going to go against that. Now, what does that sound a little bit like? Oh my gosh. Uh, the financial world has some very tall, beautiful buildings. So we don't, most investors don't see the marble and the rooms and the, and all of that, but it's all there. Yeah. yeah. They try to show it to people like us to have us buy into the same mindset so that our clients will buy into that mindset so that it works out well for them. This is not all financial institutions. I think many of them are in action. A lot of the media are in the actions they're in with no thought about whether or not they're helping people the right way. That's just not the game that they're in. Their game is to drive ratings. Their game is to sell commercial time. So now let's think about what creates this mindset of being able to speculate and gamble and get ahead of the market. Now I blame Google Charts, Yahoo Finance. <laughs> now, what I mean by that is you can go in and you can get all kinds of historical perspective, which is great depending on the mindset you put the historical perspective in. Because if we have a market timing frame and that's how we enter into the conversation, we're going to look at 2008 and so, oh yeah, I could see the S&P 500 started to slip a little bit in 2017. You really could see with the slowdown in mortgage loans, and I saw the big short, so I know that people were talking about it ahead of time. And all you need to do is exit about the summer of 2008, avoid the entire downfall, and get back in the market at the bottom. And I would have had... Now, this is the other thing to keep in mind. You would have had a significant upward swing from the bottom in the early 2009s, like March of 2009. And you would have been able to catch that swing back up. But let's put this in perspective. If you were doing that, and let's say you encountered a 40% upswing. And at the time you do that, you're in your 40s or 50s. Well, there's a couple things to be aware of. Number one, a 40% upswing on your current capital when you're mid-career has little to no chance of actually producing the kind of outcome that would be meaningful for you to be able to live a secure life in old age. And before we're done, we're going to offer not a why. big Go. enough capital for 40% up to grow to that final number that you need to to get to anyway. Exactly right. Yeah. And it's going to require a whole lot more disciplined setting money aside, putting money in your wealth coordination account, buying assets, 
and staying disciplined for a long horizon of time. Even if you get the 40% swing, so Corey and I didn't talk about this ahead of time, so I'm just curious what his first answer is going to be live in front of all of you. But Corey, what is someone likely to do if they did get that big win? So they actually somehow did all that in yeah. 2008. And I've got to remember to throw some, oh, I was just thinking of this questions at, at you. Like that's yeah. too big of an opportunity to miss. So they're going to they're gonna draw the wrong conclusion and the, wrong, the conclusion they're going to draw this attribution bias is that they did it, that mm -hmm. something amazing happened because they're seeing it now looking into the, into the past. And it happens so quickly for us. Think about, you know, Jordan, this might be a great time to flash a long-term like S and P 500 chart up on the screen for a few minutes and post. If we think about that, because if everyone just looks back to March to the first day of this big drop that we've, we've had, and it's going to look only about, this big on that scale mm -hmm. and then if you go back in the last 10 years you're probably going to find 18 different times that that much drop happened in one day so at any one of those points what happened in the last few months could have also happened it just didn't and that's what we forget is the signs looked exactly the same and didn't end up the way it did this time as it did this time and the way it ended up this yeah. time well, and, the, and the, the, you know, there's an old saying that's always darkest before the light. But here's the funny thing about economic recovery. What's that? The dawn. Always Thank darkest you. before the dawn. When it gets light. Thank I knew, you. I knew no, no, I, I appreciate that. Guys, now, me straight. we just People, saved 20 Our emails. listeners right now were screaming yeah. in their cars yeah. going, Corey, correct him. So it's always darkest before the dawn. But here's another corollary to that, which is, right before everything gets better looks exactly the same as right before everything gets much worse. <laughs> it like, it, there's just these yeah. critical moments. You, and in those critical moments, like as an example, when all of the States were saying, we need more respirators, we need more respirators. We're not going to have enough for everybody. Now, as it turns out on the back end, there was nobody that needed a respirator that didn't get one. Just think about that for a moment. That may it, be in New York in some yeah, hospital. There, well, there, but, there were yeah. several that were saying across the country, several states saying, we need more. Right. Now, that was during the peak. But what did people do? Human ingenuity took action. People got the ventilators where they needed to go. All that stuff filled in. But that moment of we're not going to have enough ventilators, those of you listening are probably paying attention or looked at some of the graphs where they went over total capacity. And what happened was that darkness actually exposed the dawn of human capacity mm -hmm. to bring the light. The, just know that anytime everything looks really, really, really bad, it looks exactly the same as it does right before it gets much better. And I think the 30% climb in the market over about the last six weeks or so really demonstrates that is that right at that bottom, people were saying, oh my gosh, this is it. It's all falling apart. It's not going to work. And then the market came back up 30%. Now we're just absolutely pleased that our investors took our education early on, understanding the markets, et cetera, and they haven't flinched in this moment. The only clients of ours that have gone to cash were because they had to have some money in cash because of some other things going on in their life, which we're going to talk about your financial aims in a few minutes. We're going to talk about how those should dictate your decisions. Life. I mean, isn't this is as great a time as any to switch over to the the other mindset, right? Heck no. I'm not done talking about this market what? timing mindset, Corey. We just got a, little, we a couple other cherries I need to put on. And, and so here's what, you know, Corey kind of talked about how it's ideally supposed to happen. You see it coming, you sell out and you, you sell out. You don't, I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you out. sell out, but you sell your positions <laughs> and then you sit back and wait until it feels like this is where I need to invest. Now, in reality, that's not what happens. What really happens is the market drops because you didn't see it coming because you're not watching all the variables, which are countless, like stars in the universe, the amount of variables that go into what's happening with the market each day. And you can't take all of them into account. So you're going to miss something. So you don't see the crash coming. You sell out after the crash and after it's gone down 20%. 
Not to mention for the years ahead of time while you were watching for the crash, you had some diminution in your overall enjoyment of life. The market goes down. Now, let me correct. I said you. I didn't mean to say you. We love you. You're listening to our podcast. You share the podcast with your friends. You do reviews for the podcast. We send you a book. I'll talk more about that later. We love you. But the market You're probably timer, not the market timer. Right. Yeah. So, right. but the market timer is going to sell their positions after a loss and wait until they feel like it's comfortable or a good time to get back in. And that re-entry point almost never occurs below the point at which they sold. Now, there's two reasons for this. One of the biggest is this idea of the, we want confirmation bias for the decisions that we've made. So the confirmation bias is, okay, I got out because I think the market's going lower. And so what are you only watching for? What does that do to your view of the world overall? I'm just waiting Maybe for the next even thing. Maybe how fall. you talk to your kids or your spouse. Like it just seems like it would prevailingly infect everything. Yeah. You're certainly not going to watch the news for what good news is happening because any good news for the economy, for stocks, for the country maybe, now occurs like bad news to you because of these like, I don't know, they're not like rose colored glasses. They're some sort of- Hoop colored glasses. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> I was gonna slip Paul, there and make this an Paul explicit episode. I wanted to say it, but he up. wasn't sure that I was gonna be okay with him saying it. So I just went ahead and said it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, so. And here's what actually happens. Let's say the market goes back up like it is today. Maybe someone's listening who has been in the market timing mindset and they're now opening up their browser and looking going, oh my gosh, is the market really up 30% since I sold? Yes, it is. And we've even looked at some of the internal data for some of these major mutual fund companies. And what's also amazing in past market crashes is the greatest amount of redemptions from mutual funds and uh, variable annuity sub accounts comes from or comes at the very bottom. That's why you see all the volume tick up. It's because all these asset managers are having to make liquidity in their portfolios so that they can get cash to what are mainly undisciplined investors. And then this is what your solution is. If you're a market timer, we're going to talk about the solution if you're a disciplined investor. Market goes down, you sell, you now watch for more bad news, which bad news doesn't just do it. Sometimes the market goes up on bad news or what we would might think were, was bad news because maybe it's not as bad I as mean, the market was expecting. It's certainly been the case for the last month. It's not like we've had a ton of great news, but it maybe is less bad than we thought in the markets. Surprisingly well, and in this case, the, I, the market may, and I say may because there's so many prognosticators that say the market is, we had a, a client yesterday, just yesterday say to us, and I thought it was so funny, Corey, it's same thing you and I have talked about. He said, it's so dumb. I go onto one of these finance pages and it says, you know, the futures are down half a percent. Market will be in turmoil today because whatever new news came out. And he says, then the market opens and it's like half a percent up. And then they'll change the story. The market is up because it's like, again, pattern recognition of human beings. We notice something happened. There must be a or a relatively small amount of causes to that that we think we could speak to. So you now have to walk around looking for the bad in the economy, looking for the bad in the world so that you can get back in. And, and I say this lovingly to any of you who have played this game a little bit, I just call it a fool's game. It's only a fool's game because the just the market overall for the last hundred years has been up about three quarter percent of the time, or yeah, three and a quarter, seventy five percent of the time. I feel like Yosemite Sam. I'll just change what I'm going to say <laughs> uh, <laughs> instead of tripping over it. So because of that, that means you wouldn't go play a Vegas table game that was clearly labeled that you will only win one out of four times. You never play that game, no. but people do it all the time when they do market timing. So that is kind of the whole of the market timing mindset and what it can do to you personally to be in a position where you have to now watch for the downside. Now, in just a minute, we're going to come back from commercial. We're going to hear a little bit from Sound Financial Group, show you guys how you can get in touch with us or how we may be of help to you. 
But right after we come back, we're going to talk about the disciplined investor mindset and what it allows you to do in a crash like the one we've just experienced. Paul Adams here at Sound Financial Group. Are you curious what you can accomplish with our help? You're here enjoying the show. Our philosophy is helping you increase your effectiveness with money, and now we have a way to help you take another step on your financial journey. We have designed a financial inquiry call for you and the thousands of other listeners of Your Business, Your Wealth. This is a complimentary 15-minute conversation where one of our team members will ask you some key questions, understand your concerns, and if appropriate, schedule a time for further conversation with an advisor. If you look at the episode description, you'll see a link to schedule a call at a time that's least invasive for you. And even if now's not the right time for us to work together, we'll point you toward resources to help you in your financial journey. We always look forward to connecting with our listeners, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Welcome back to Your Business, Your Wealth, talking about investor mindsets and the big question, which one will you choose? So here is the alternative to the market timing mindset, and that's the disciplined investor. And you might be surprised to hear that the first piece that I'm going to talk about has nothing to do with the market. That's right. The disciplined investor starts with building out the future that you want and keeping that in mind, where you're aiming, the goals that you have, and build the set of decisions you're going to be in based on that future before entering in the market, before looking at what the market is going to, going to do. Because before. the disciplined investor builds that strategy in advance so that it works regardless of what the market's going to do. Well, and it's and it's even before you choose how much volatility your portfolio should have, how much should be stocks before you even bonds. choose, right? Because you may not even go into the market at all based on the future that you want. If you're listening now, and your entire recommendation for what your portfolio should look like in terms of risk was primarily from a questionnaire that was asked of you, this is the reason why we don't make that our primary when we work with clients. We show them past markets. This is what it would have looked like in 2008. This is what it would have looked like in 2000. If you had this mix, if you if you were in 1987, what would have actually happened to give our clients a bit of a simulator? So one of the reasons why I think our clients did so well in this is that we actually looked at past performance of portfolios and said, this is what it might look like if another 2008 happened. And then they are like, okay, yep, I could get through that. I could, or no, I couldn't. Let's put a little more bonds in. And they made that decision based upon the future they want at the outset. Step one for the investor mindset, build your investing based upon your future aims. And here's why that has to come first. Because if we don't do that first, then uh, when we go to the market, we're almost guaranteed to have dissatisfaction with the outcome because here's what most people do especially in the market timing mindset is we say okay we've got some chunk of money maybe you've got a stock that was an ipo from your company or just a great portfolio that's been doing well and now you're saying okay i need to fund the rest of my my life like what should i do and you say okay i'm going to sell half now and then see what happens for the rest. So this is a, this is a very common variation of this, sell a little bit at a time, get out of the market. So you're going to be dissatisfied either way because if you sell half of that amazing portfolio now and the market takes off over the next five years, then you're, oh, I wish I wouldn't have sold any and it could have just kept growing. If you sell half now and the market just tanks, I should have gotten all out. Mm -hmm. And so either way, and the market's never just flat for very, for long periods of time. It's either going up or going down. Now, if you start, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, uh, you keep going. I'll hit rebalancing because I think that people can think a relatively flat market means they don't make any money. Got you. Great. So, yeah. So, uh, Paul will come in with the actual, what the investor does in the market. So, if, if you start by building your future first, what you want to have happen to be satisfied with, with life, and then sell however much of the portfolio you need to get that done, then whatever happens next is just what happens next. And you already have the life that you want. So the market's going to go up or it's going to go down. 
but you made the right decision either way for you and your life because you got what you what you wanted and you can be satisfied so paul once they've got themselves in order which which speaks to why you should have a coach because mm -hmm. you cannot see your own golf swing no matter how good you are and as a result you've got to have that outside observer with you you and your spouse having a conversation about that future and what's going to be the most effective way the most optimal way to close the gap in distance between where you are today and that future state that you're solving for. Now, it also takes us to the ability of, well, you're saying if I don't market time, I never get to buy low and sell high. And my answer is yes, but we get to do something better. You see, when you buy low, sell high, you have no idea in the market timing world whether or not now is a relative high or a relative low. You have no way to know that. Now you could guess at it, and sometimes those guesses, those bets do work out. Every now and then, somebody leaves a casino with a bunch of money. But most of the time, the casino keeps a bunch of money. So to rebalance means each year, at least yearly, you're going to go back to the original portfolio that you chose. Now in a market downturn, you let's say you had a portfolio that's 80% stocks, 20% bonds. Well, at the depth of this downturn, you may have had your portfolio drop on the equity side by say 30%, which means your 80% of your portfolio that was supposed to be stocks is now much less. Now maybe it's 55%. Well, that means we had another chunk of the portfolio called fixed income that's been stable. The bonds have been stable, <laughs> especially if you choose them correctly or not market time with extra long-term bonds, et cetera, the way we do it very short-term bonds, lots of stability. We can sell those and buy equities because the equities are at a relative low compared to fixed income. So we actually, with our rebalancing, when the market takes steep downturns, we can get an advantage by rebalancing in that downturn so that we sell the things that have performed well and we buy those things, those asset classes that have not done well. Then step three is invest more if you can. If you had some money on the sidelines, you were thinking about it, hadn't quite made the move yet, et cetera, that is where you take additional territory. Getting your money at work in the market, putting yourself in the position that you're going to gain from what might be referred to as a discount. Now, we're not going after preferred market entry, trying to catch the bottom. It's more like if we looked at stocks in January and we're like, wait, we'd like to buy all those stocks. That's going to be part of our investing strategy for the future. Well, as of mid-March, we had a significant and steep discount on all those same stocks. So what you would never do if you, let's say you liked a particular kind of suit or a particular set of clothing that you want to wear and you go by the store and they're all on sale, 30% off. Well, the first thing you do is consider maybe, do I need a couple more? Maybe I should get one. But the last thing that would be on your radar is what I should do is run home into my closet. And all these clothes I was perfectly happy with before, they're all being discounted. This is terrible. And then you run home and put all your suits on offer up. Now, we <laughs> laugh because of course we would never do that. But isn't that what's being taught to us about money with our investments? Oh my gosh. So, and Paul, on the invest more if you can, I think that, I mean, it's so important that it's if you can, meaning if it's the right time for your life mm. and your goals, not just because the market is is down. Ex like we've had lots of clients that we've that we've talked out of putting more in the market right now because there's no guarantee that it comes back up very quickly or it doesn't go down more. And if you've got other things going on your in your life where that cash needs to go then that's the better move to make. It's always about refer your life to, first, refer the to market step one. second. Yeah, refer to step one that yeah. Corey gave earlier. That is right. perfect because you're right. It does have to fit your aims. And these are hierarchical in order. So you don't need to put yourself in a position where you go at risk unnecessarily just to get a discount on equities. And then last is we got to have patience. We have to have patience in the ability for the portfolio to do its thing. Now, sometimes we have to be patient for a year or two for the financial mechanics to manifest in a way that you see them in your portfolio. But sometimes it's a month 
and the market is up 30% like we've seen just recently. Not quite a month, it's like six weeks, but real fast. And I can't tell you how many people that I had a conversation with who would say, well, I think I'll just leave some money in cash. I just don't know. I don't, it doesn't feel good what's going on in the market. Or and and what I mean is like strangely enough, most of these are non-clients. But I think I'm just gonna leave my powder on the sidelines. I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. It's like, well, 30% return. How many of them would have thrown their mother under a bus to get 30%? <laughs> well, I, right. I was just thinking of the I old don't know movie, throw, throwing their throw mother mama, under throw mama but from the train, you know? Right. So throw but, mama exactly. But but that's the they crave that return but then don't want to deploy, but it's because they haven't thought through these rules initially before they invested of what it means to be a disciplined investor. This is the reason why major major institutional money, endowments, pensions, et cetera, tend to perform far better than any of us do individually when we are market timing speculating. The reason is disciplined. They are disciplined investors they don't jump money in and out of the market. And as a result, they produce better returns over time. So I think we better wrap it. What do you think people should do from this today, Corey? I think if you're working with an advisor, you should send them this, this episode and say, do you, and, and just ask them if they're, if you've got a good relationship and they're in a, in a coaching kind of consultative kind of relationship with you, then you can ask them this honest question. Like, do you think I've been more of a disciplined investor or more of a market timer mm. and just, and just give them, grant them the, the space to have that conversation with you. It may be a conversation you've never been able to have before, and they can really help you open up some new ground and see where maybe some parts of your strategy have not been working as well as it could, not because of anything out there, but because any, because of what's happening in, in here, it may not be the most fun conversation but it could be one of the most valuable that you have this entire year yes and and if you found yourself listening to this episode going I, i've done some of that market timing i'm kind of on the needle i did a couple little stocks or i did i did something yeah. and i'm really hoping it works out because here's what to be clear there are inefficient markets where you can produce outsiders returns for those people that build a lot of knowledge in real estate it happens all the time pricing is inefficient if you were super good at ordering stuff from some other country and having it manufactured and then selling it into the US market. Like that's an inefficient pricing that exists in the marketplace that you as a supplier could take advantage of. Nearly every successful business owner listening to this podcast has benefited in their business from an inefficiency in pricing. That inefficiency just doesn't exist as it relates to equities the same way it does in all these other areas that our human brains go after pattern recognition. And so if you found yourself kind of tipping your toe into that, or you found yourself selling out of your portfolio in the midst of all of this, my encouragement would be reach out to us. Have a conversation with one of our team. We will take the time to understand a little bit about your concerns. And at a minimum, even if it doesn't make sense for us to work together, at a minimum, we'll get you pointed in the best direction we could see or the best steps for you to take next. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to quietly listen to the podcast and hope that it all works out or hope that you'll trip over somebody that can give you this kind of help. It, it's probably going to be hard to find somebody that's going to talk like this with you. And for those of you that share this with your advisor, we hope that it creates a new relationship where they can share with you the same way that we do here on the podcast, being frank, being direct, and giving you the best chance of producing the future outcome that you want. So now, just a to link, remind, oh, there's a link in the, in the show notes mm -hmm. and... If you want to spend that time with us, you can get 15 minutes with someone on our team just to get the conversation started, see how we can help from there. And just know that if you're a listener and you're clicking that link and you want to want to talk, we don't care what your balance sheet looks like. We want to spend a little time with everybody that that wants to have that chat. And if even if we're not the best long term source of help, that's OK. We'll find that help with you because we want our listeners to get get taken care of. Yeah, that will said, Corey. And, and this is just a little reminder. We would love it. It means the world to us. And it, more importantly, it means the world to everybody else who might get a chance to hear this episode. We, mm -hmm. we get to hear from new people that are new clients of ours who only heard of this because you posted it on social media, who only heard of our podcast because you sent them a text with it. 
They've only heard of our podcast because they tripped over the review that you did on iTunes. So here's my ask, encouragement. We need your help with this. Do a review of the podcast. Share the episode with a friend. Fact that for those of you consistent listeners, I would encourage, put yourself in the discipline of posting every one of our podcasts that you listen to to your social media and just writing a sentence or two about it. It'll help further deepen your learning and create new conversations within your community that'll help you be more financially responsible and on track for your aims for the future. And if you're willing to do that, make that social media post, do the iTunes review, just send us a screenshot of it. Tag us if it's on social. You can find me at ask at Ask Paul Adams on Twitter and Instagram. Of course, find Corey and I both on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Your Business, Your Wealth on Facebook. So what you can do is post that. Send us the screenshot to info at sfgwa.com, and we'll send you a copy of our latest book, Sound Financial Advice so that you get the chance to really sit back, read something that'll contribute to your long-term financial aims, your personal aims. And as always, from me, from Corey, from Jordan, our video engineer, and everybody from Sound Financial Group, we hope that this has been a contribution to you being able to design and build a good life. Hey guys, so glad you could tune in and watch that video. I wanna remind you to subscribe, Be sure to hit the notification bell so you can get the latest piece of financial knowledge we release. And don't forget, go to Amazon, get a copy of Sound Financial Advice. Why? Because it'll make you better looking and smarter.